Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Finding Royal Connections in Your Family Tree. My name is Ginevra Morse. I am the Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is Zachary J. Garceau. Zach has worked for NEHGS since 2014 when he joined the research services team after receiving his master's degree in public history from the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. He was born and raised in Westerly, Rhode Island, where he now lives. And in addition to his work for NEHGS, he is also the administrative records and technical services specialist for the state of Rhode Island. His research interests include French Canadian genealogy, Rhode Island history, sports history, and royal and noble ancestry, which of course is what we'll be talking about today. So you're probably attending this lecture because you believe or maybe you've heard family stories or rumors or maybe you've even found genealogical evidence that you are descended from royalty. And you might be surprised to learn that a large number of Americans can claim descent from European nobility. So today, uh, Zach will help you navigate some of the first steps in uncovering and proving your descent from British, French, and German royalty from the 10th through the 17th centuries. We will also look at several go-to published and online resources that can assist you along the way. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to this downloadable PDF in your reminder emails, as well as in your follow-up email after today's broadcast. And we are recording this event. So starting uh, later today, you'll be able to freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website and our YouTube channel. So if you miss something on today's first listen, you can't you know, write quick enough or anything like that, not to worry, you will be able to go back, review the presentation, pause, fast forward, rewind, hear something 12 times if you want to. So again, um, if you miss something, not to worry. All right, so with all of that uh, out of the way, and without further ado, I'll turn things over to Zach. Thank you, Ginevra. Um, you know, this is a presentation I've actually been looking to do for quite some time because of all the questions I have investigated as a member of the research services team, the most frequent is, has to be, am I related to any kings or queens? The source of this question is usually family lore, with many of those inquiring having been told of a supposed descent from royalty by a relative. And oh, when we say royal, in this case, we mean not just kings and queens, but this also includes peerage, which consists of hereditary and lifetime titles, which are composed of noble ranks, knights and other military warriors, and attendants and members of the royal court. One of those members of the royal court was the steward of the king's household, which, despite how it sounds, was actually a role carrying significant political power and was a member of England's cabinet ranking until 1782. Another notable role um, royal court member was the esquire of the body, who was the personal attendant to the king or queen and was a position that served as an important stepping stone in the career of a courtier. In peerage, um, some of the titles and um, noble English titles and ranks um, that we'd be talking about today, um, the first is a duke, which ranks second on the hierarchy, just below kings and princes, and they rule over a duchy, which is also known as a dukedom. The first duchy uh, was created in England was the Duchy of Cornwall, which was established by royal charter in 1337. Today, the Duke of Cornwall is traditionally held by the eldest son of the reigning British monarch. As an aside, it is important to note that many peerage titles become extinct and can be recreated. For example, 
The title of Duke of Cambridge was first created in 1660 and was bestowed upon James Stewart, who died unmarried, and the title became extinct. The title was recreated in 1667 and then again became extinct in 1671. It was created for a third time in 1701 and was awarded to Prince George, who then merged the title with the crown when he succeeded his father as King George II. The title was created a fourth time in 1801 and a fifth time in 2011 when it was awarded to Prince William, who is the current holder of that title. In England, a Marquess ranks below a Duke, but is above an Earl, and the name Marquess is derived from the marches, or borderlands, between England, Scotland, and Wales, which served as the domains of these peers. The first Marquess in England was Robert de Vere, who was appointed the Marquess of Dublin by King Richard II in 1385. In the Holy Roman Empire, a Marquess is known as a Margrave. The next ranking in the peerage hierarchy is an earl, which ranks above a Marquess in modern times, but was closer to a duke many centuries ago. Earls were also often military leaders. The title of earl is equivalent to a count in continental Europe, and the title of earl has origins in Anglo-Saxon England. Below an earl is the title of viscount. Uh, these were largely ju judicial or administrative positions and only became hereditary titles much later. The first use of the title of Viscount as a peer was in 1440 when King Henry VI appointed John Beaumont, John Beaumont as Viscount Beaumont. After a Viscount, there is the title of Baron, which is an individual that rules over a barony. A Baron ranks above a Lord or Knight, and the title of Baron was brought to England by way of the Norman Conquest in 1066. And Baronets are um, the only British hereditary honor that is not considered a peer. The eldest son of a baronet inher inherits the baronetcy upon the death of the baronet. Like knights, baronets are styled with sir before their name. Knights and dames are not peers, and these titles are created as a dignity within an order of chivalry. Uh, this includes the most notable order of the Garter, which was founded in 1348, and is the most senior order of knighthood in the British honor system. Another no notable honor order of chivalry is the most ancient and noble order of the Thistle, which was founded in 1687 and is associated with Scotland. The dignities of knights and dames can be used for the recipient's lifetime only and cannot be inherited. And here we actually see um, some of the emblems that are associated with these various titles. And if you'd like to learn more, you can actually visit the website that is listed below. And while many noble titles are fairly similar between Britain and continental Europe, there are some titles which are unique and are not used in the United Kingdom. One such title is that of an archduke, which ranks below an emperor or a king, but is above a prince or a duke. Another title, that is ranked below an emperor or a king is a grand prince, which is a sovereign prince in the hierarchy, which is above a sovereign prince in the hierarchy, rather. Uh, one term that is unique to the French royalty is the Dauphin, which is the title given to the heir to the French throne. And unfortunately, while there is no widely accepted figure for the number or percentage of Americans who are descended from European royalty, um, however, given that Charlemagne lived approximately 40 generations ago, there are roughly one trillion possible ancestors from this generation. And with that in mind, descent from Charlemagne is not as unlikely as you might think. And as a personal example, given my family name, you can probably surmise that my ancestry is largely French Canadian. I had always thought that my family was French Canadian, Italian, with a little small percentage of Irish. While this is true, uh, through my research, I found that I had one line which contained multiple colonial American ancestors, including John Alden of the Mayflower and a man by the name of Robert Abel. Additional research revealed that Robert Abel was uh, what is known as a gateway ancestor, and he was descended from many kings of England, Holy Roman emperors, and many other royals in Europe. So, as you may have guessed, most individuals of the royal ancestry are not part of the nobility today, 
wish as I might, I have no real claim to the British throne, but the question then becomes, when did these lines depart from their noble status? In many cases, royal descendants lost their claim to nobility in the generations leading up to the Great Migration to America in the first half of the 17th century. Interestingly, descent from many of the kings and queens of England also opens up connections to many other noble families from France and Germany. These royal families intermarried at various times throughout history. And one notable example of an intermarriage connecting French and English royalty was the marriage of Herbert III, Count of Vermandois, the fifth great grandson of Charlemagne, who married the daughter of Edward the Elder, who was the King of England. And you can see this is a portion of my own royal ancestry in the Abel line, which showcases the loss of noble status. The great grandfather of Robert Abel, George Cotton, was an esquire of the body, which was a member of the royal court of Henry VIII. And George Cotton's son, Richard, was styled as esquire. Although he built and maintained a manor house, he still died intestate. Richard's daughter, Frances Cotton, married George Abel, who was recorded as a gentleman. It's the will of George Abel, though, that serves as evidence of the family's departure from noble status when it was written. In regard to the charges I have been at in applying him, meaning Robert, in a good trade in London, which he hath made no use of, and since in furnishing him for New England, where I hope he is now. The fact that George Abel attempted to have Robert engage in a trade suggests the family was no longer of noble status. And now um, we'd like to just talk a little bit about how you would get started with this process. And when beginning your research, the first step should always be to create a family tree in which you trace back as many lines as possible, as far back as possible. Your focus should be on taking these lines back as far as you possibly can. It may be helpful to create a multi-generational chart showing all the known ancestors, and a fan chart is usually ideal as it shows the most ancestors at one time, affording the most possible options. And here we can actually see an example of a fan chart that I created, and it shows the ancestry from my ancestor, Joseph Parsons Luther, all the way back to Robert Abel. So this is a good example of something that you could create, which gives you multiple options in looking for a specific line. And your first step should always be to search for any known gateway ancestor in your family tree. Gateway ancestors are individuals with established, proven descent from a particularly noteworthy person or family. If you can prove you are descended from a confirmed gateway ancestor, you're already halfway to finding a royal connection. Several lineage societies have widely available lists of accepted gateway ancestors online. We'll talk a little bit more about these lineage societies later in this presentation. And the gateway ancestors are almost always first or second generation immigrants to America in the 17th century. Gateway ancestors are both notable figures in colonial history as well as, as those of common status. Among the more notable gateway ancestors are colonial governors of Virginia, including Sir William Berkeley, who is seen here, New Jersey, New York, Maryland, South Carolina, Massachusetts, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, as well as many known clergymen such as Reverend Gregory Dexter and Reverend Peter Bulkley. It's important to bear in mind that while most of these gateway ancestors were born and resided in America, there are also many who settled in other locations such as the West Indies, Quebec, Newfoundland, and even Mexico. If you already have confirmed your descent from any of the individuals I just mentioned, congratulations, you have royal ancestors. And here are some links to gateway ancestors provided by two of the more well-known lineage societies. If you don't find a gateway ancestor right away, there is no need to abandon your search. Not finding a match immediately is very, it's a very common issue that most researchers face, and it certainly does not mean you do not have royal ancestors. When this happens, your first action should be to re-examine your family tree if you have already conducted some research. You should then locate any ancestors whose parents you have not yet identified, and a good match would be an ancestor with a line that simply stopped in the late 18th century. 
This may be a prime candidate for finding an ancestor with royal roots. And once you find a line with missing ancestors, you will need to work backwards until you are able to trace the line back to the original settlers in America. When doing this, I recommend starting with the ancestors you have traced back the farthest, as this will lead to faster results in most cases. Because many Mayflower passengers were farmers, hired hands, servants, and members of the working class, it may not be all that surprising that only one Mayflower passenger has children with known documented royal ancestry. This passenger was Richard Moore. In 1959, a document was discovered which identified the parents of Richard Moore and his three siblings as Samuel and Catherine Moore. Catherine was a known descendant of King Edward III and therefore Edward I and other kings of England. Of the four more children, only Richard survived the winter and the first winter in Plymouth and went on to have descendants. And now we'll actually be looking at a brief case study that'll help you to get a sense of how you would identify these gateway ancestors through one of these lines. So in this example, you know that you are descended from a man named Warren Green, who was born on June 9th, 1712 in Barnstable, Massachusetts. You review the list of gateway ancestors for the baronial order of the Magna Carta and the order of the Crown of Charlemagne, two of the most popular royal ancestry lineage societies. For both societies, the only known Green gateway ancestor is Thomas Green of St. Mary's County, Maryland. Given the distance between Maryland and Massachusetts, we can surmise that these individuals are like, unlikely to be related. So now what? Your next step is going to be to trace the ancestry of Warren Green backwards to look for any possible connections to gateway ancestors that can be found. First, you search the town records of Barnstable, which leads you to the birth record of Warren Green, which then shows that he was the son of William and Desire Green. And then next, you locate a marriage record, which indicates that William Green married Desire Bacon in, seven, in March of 1709 in Barnstable. And because you know there is only one Green ancestor who is a gateway ancestor, your best option in this case would be to search for the ancestry of the wives of the men in this line, as they will provide you with additional surnames to search for. Bearing this in mind, your next action should be to locate the parents of Desire Bacon. The Barnstable town records also lead you to the birth record of this Desire Bacon, which shows that she was the daughter of John Bacon and his wife, Mary Hawes. Another look at the list of gateway ancestors for the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne reveals that there is an Edmund Hawes on this list. Knowing this, you'll need to determine if Mary Hawes is a relative or descendant of this Edmund Hawes. According to the vital records, Mary Hawes was born in 1664 and was the daughter of a John Hawes of Yarmouth. As you'll find in the Great Migration, John Hawes, the father of Mary, was the son of Edmund Hawes, the known gateway ancestor. With this information, you have now confirmed that Warren Green is a descendant of Edmund Hawes, and therefore, through your ancestry to Warren Green, you are also a descendant of Edmund Hawes, who was himself a descendant of Charlemagne. And this is just a uh, listing of the descent from going from John Hawes, taking it all the way back to King Henry II. So this is just a good example of what it would look like when you actually locate the ancestor from the gateway ancestor to the royal, which is something that we'll be talking about a little bit more. And then the next step is connecting your gateway ancestor to royalty. And it's important when you do this to note that you don't need to reinvent the wheel and looking at published sources is always the most important way to identify this as a lot of the work has already been done in a lot of these, although it is very possible to find um, lines that either aren't readily available in these sources or they may not be listed just because there are so many different lines that um, could be researched. So. Um, that would be the next step is to make that connection at that point. And just to go over some of the sources that um, would be the most helpful um, is 
Uh, so the first is the works of Douglas Richardson, who is a genealogist and a historian who has written many works that focus largely on the English royalty and gentry. His most well-known books are Magna Carta Ancestry, which consists of four volumes, Plantagenet Ancestry, a three-volume series, and Royal Ancestry, which is comprised of five volumes. All of these works are extensively sourced and are considered highly accurate. For this reason, they are generally accepted by all lineage societies concerning royal ancestry. These sources trace back almost exclusively to English nobles, although intermarriages between royal houses may result in ancestry spread across several countries. And therefore, tracing yourself back to these English nobles can be a great jumping off point for finding other European noble ancestors. And this is an example from an entry in one volume of Richardson's Magna Carta Ancestry. This serves as evidence of the extensive research that is involved, as this one entry alone cites 18 different sources. These sources include a combination of genealogical journals, peerage sources, parish, re parish registers, and secondary historical sources. And now, as you'll see here, um, this is an example of an entry from Plantagenet Ancestry. All of Richardson's works are sorted alphabetically by the surname of the most recent ancestor that's listed. Given that many individuals share common ancestral lines back to the Plantagenet Kings or Magna Carta Barons, works by Douglas Richardson often display these lines in a truncated form as shown here. Uh, reading the body of the text of these entries is also important as they often reference associated lines which can be traced by following the internal references. In this case, you would be able to trace the ancestry of Thomas Stoner by referring to the Stoner family section and then locating entry number 12, which would be the entry for Thomas. And another uh, series of works that are very helpful in this research is those that are written by NEHGS's very own Gary Boyd Roberts. And these sources, which originally were known as RD500, then RD600, and most recently RD900, also contain lines directly from immigrants to America going back to their royal forebears. In this example from RD900, we can see the ancestry of John Freak of Massachusetts all the way back to King Edward I of England. And as you can see, these lines show the connections between generations, and although they do not contain biographical information, they are incredibly useful for identifying royal ancestral connections. And if you're searching for connections to royalty in countries outside of England, uh, the works of Frederick Lewis Weiss um, are the best sources available. There are lines in this work that go back to kings and queens and other nobles in Germany, Spain, Portland, or sorry, Poland rather, Italy, Ukraine, Jerusalem, Scandinavia, and more. Uh, this work is perhaps best used for searching multiple related lines. In these examples, after Elizabeth Howard's name, you'll notice that there is a 22 36. This means that Elizabeth Howard's ancestry can be traced using line number 22 and starting with entry number 36. This book was most recently published in an eighth edition. And if possible, I recommend using the eighth edition as lines are updated between editions. And in some cases where sources could not be verified, lines were also canceled. In the early 16th century, the improper use of coats of arms in England was considered a widespread problem. In response to this issue, the King of England authorized surveys, which were to be conducted across the country with representatives of the crown, recording the pedigrees of those claiming rights to coats of arms. The major purpose of these accountings was to correct any irregularities in the use of arms. The records of these surveys, known as heraldic visitations, are a critical resource for genealogists. They are considered to be fairly accurate record of pedigrees many of which go back as far as the 13th century. These records generally do not extend back to royalty, so finding your ancestor in these records does not necessarily indicate a descent from a king, but that being said, these visitations can still be used to identify connections through multiple generations. It's important to note, however, 
that because the College of Arms has only recently granted access to its records, older published volumes of these records were based on second and third hand accounts and may contain some errors. You can find visitation records which were published in the 19th and 20th centuries online and in the NEHGS library. The first visitations were conducted under warrant granted by King Henry VIII, dated April 6, 1530. Heraldic visitations were then performed on a nearly annual basis, with the exception of periods spanning 1532 to 1552, 1592 to 1611, and then 1634 to 1662. The final visitation was carried out in London and ended in 1700. During the course of these visitations, every county in England was surveyed at least twice, while Essex was surveyed the most with six times in total. Unfortunately, there was never a complete visitation carried out in Wales, although four partial visitations were performed, the first of which was begun in the early 1530s. There were also six visitations conducted in Ireland, but they are not nearly as comprehensive as those from England. While there were many sources that are accepted by lineage societies, there are also several that are considered unreliable and should not be used. These sources include the Magna Carta Barons and their American descendants, and Americans of royal descent, both by Charles Henry Browning, as well as Magna Carta by John S. Wirtz and the abridged Compendium of American Genealogy by Frederick A. Vergus. According to the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne, for example, the Magna Carta Barons and their American descendants is an excellent roadmap, but does not reflect the proofs that are necessary for membership. Most lineage societies will not accept information from the aforementioned works due to their unreliability and lack of verified sources. These sources may contain ancestral lines which have been debunked and should not be considered adequate proof. It is important to remember, however, that finding a line in one of these sources does not make it untrue, but instead, this line should be verified using one of the more reliable sources which we have discussed already. And now we'll be talking a little bit about how to use these different sources. And um, so many genealogical sources use a wide variety of terms in both Latin and English, which are critical to understanding the information that is being presented. For example, the letters DSP means desicite sin pro, which translates to died without issue. There are several words which are used to modify this phrase, including desicite sin pro mascula or legitima, uh, meaning either that the person died without male issue or legitimate issue, respectively. Another fact to keep in mind is that many of the surnames that begin with fits were used to indicate a son's father, the modifier Fitz was used to mean son of. And prior to the 16th century, surnames could vary based on the person's father. For example, a man named Robert Fitzwilliam, the son of a man named William, may have a son who would adopt the surname Fitzrobert. This is the origin of several surnames that are common today, including Fitzgerald, Fitzpatrick, and Fitzwilliam. I've included some variations of the most common used names in between the 10th and 17th centuries, many of which appear in older works, especially those which retain the spelling from original records. Knowing the terms for son and daughter in Welsh is also important in many cases, as sources chronicling Welsh families uh, will use these terms. Another feature that is utilized in some sources, particularly those transcribing medieval and early modern records, is regnal years, uh, the method of recording a date of an event based upon the ruler at the time. Generally, they can be read as uh, the nth year of the reign of whoever was the king at that time. Visitation records, uh, where this form of dating is often used, tend to abbreviate the name of the king or queen. And note that regnal years, except for the last, begin and end on the date that the ruler ascended to the throne and not on January 1st. In the example provided here, um, that would be read as the 23rd year of the reign of Edward III, which, descent, which extended from January 25th, 1360 to January 25th, 1361. And now here we have a small portion of a record from the 1531 visitation of Somerset, 
And let's break down this record a little bit. At number one at the top, uh, there's a brief description of the family's arms or the arms that they claimed. I won't go into deep detail on this as heraldry could fill its own presentation. But in this case, the description indicates that it is divided into small squares of red and gold with an upper portion containing a blue and white pattern. And then at number two in the middle, uh, this abbreviation indicates that the person died in the eighth year of the reign of Henry V, or between March 1420 and March 1421. At number three, we'll see that the abbreviation SP, which is short for Desisit Sin Pro, meaning he died without issue, which is why that line does not go any further. And at number four, uh, this indicates that William de la Pole, the Duke of Suffolk, died in 1450 at the age of 54, and therefore he was born in 1396. And here is actually a calculator that is incredibly helpful when calculating those regnal years, especially because um, it's difficult to sometimes, unless you were able to look at it in another source, to know offhand when the year would start and end, and also just to bear in mind um, the years that each individual king or queen was reigning. So this is an incredibly helpful calculator that I highly recommend for this. And children born to royals outside of marriage were considered illegitimate, but in some instances, they were later legitimized and went on to hold noble titles. The surname Fitzroy, which translates to son of a king, may be taken up by an illegitimate child of a royal. These children occasionally may be the source of royal descent and should certainly be considered as viable sources. There are lineage societies which specifically serve those who are descended from illegitimate children of royalty. And some of the more notable illegitimate children of royals include Philip of Cognac, who is the son of Richard the Lionheart, Henry Fitzroy, the son of Henry VIII, and John Beaufort, the Earl of Somerset, who was the son of John of Gaunt and therefore the grandson of Edward III. And now um, a little bit more about these lineage societies. Um, once you find a royal connection, there are several lineage societies that you can join. Some of these are the descendants of the illegitimate sons and daughters of the kings and queens of Britain, which, as the name implies, caters to those who are descended from the illegitimate children of royalty. And the Order of the Crown of Charlemagne in the United States, which spe specifically serves descendants of Charlemagne, and also the Baronial Order of the Magna Carta and the National Society of Magna Carta Dames and Barons, both of which serve the descendants of these Magna Carta Barons. And at this link, you will be able to actually find a complete list of these active hereditary societies. So I highly recommend um, taking a look at this list, especially after you find any royal ancestors. As, as I was mentioning, there are ones that cater to all different types of descendants and they're all unique in different ways. So it's important to take a look at the different ones and see which one is the best fit for you based on what you're able to find. And so in summary, um, when you research your line as far back as you can, you have the most likelihood of finding uh, a connection to a gateway ancestor. And looking for those gateway ancestors is really the most important part because those open you up to proven and confirmed descent from royalty. So once you find those, it really becomes a matter of just determining how the gateway ancestor connects to the royals, but it has been proven. So that's always the first thing that you should do. And it's always important to remember as well to not assume that you don't have royal connections. Um, as I had mentioned earlier on, um, there's a lot of people, myself included, who would um, assume that they um, do not have these royal connections for one reason or another based on their ancestry, but um, unexpectedly, a lot of people will come across these, and um, so it's really important to just not make that assumption, because um, it's entirely possible that you do actually have that ancestry. And um, the one thing that I can stress more than anything is that a lot of times you really don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, 
using the published sources that are out there, especially the ones that we've highlighted here that are considered the most reliable available, um, really will give you all the information that you should need. Um, and they also really serve as a good jumping off point to find different lines that you might not have known about. So um, those published sources are really critical in doing this kind of research. So um, also when you're using those, you want to make sure that you use all of the information that's available in the source material, um, because sometimes there might be information that's hidden in a paragraph that you might not have otherwise noticed that could open up a different avenue of research. Um, like if it mentions the parents of somebody's wife that you might not have been looking for, but then you see that name and it will all kind of come together for you. And that might be a different way to um, look for a different line that you might not have considered. So I definitely recommend looking at all the information in that source material. All right, well, thank you, Zach, so much for um, that overview and look at how to get started in uh, making those connections to royal ancestors. Before we get to your questions, I do want to just share with you a few upcoming events. Um, so on January 7th, Kenneth Gloss, a rare book specialist and proprietor of Boston's renowned Brattle Bookshop, will be giving a special presentation about the history of his shop, share tips for starting and maintaining a rare book collection, and reveal his favorite finds of the hunt. And if you've inherited research from a family member and aren't sure how to proceed, be sure to join us on January 13th for tips and next steps from genealogist James Heffernan. And if you like today's topic and want to hear more about royal collections, palaces, and the stories of past royals, join us on January 20th for our annual uh, DiCamillo Rendezvous when curator of special collections Kurt DiCamillo will share some of the highlights of Britain's royal co collection. And you can learn more and register for those events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. So with that, let's get to some of your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask uh, Zach, go ahead and type your query into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time provided. Uh, a few questions that did come up um, in the chat and in the Q&A uh, about a handout. There is a syllabus that's available uh, for sale. You can find it on our online bookstore. I'll also share that link in my follow-up email. It was also included in the reminder emails as well. But as I noted at the start, this has also been recorded. So you can freely go back on our website and YouTube channel and um, pause and record full URLs, anything that you didn't get to um, note down or jot down today. Um, so let's see, one question um, that has come up, there are several questions. Um, Maureen asks about, you showed a beautiful fan chart uh, earlier on, are there online sources that provide the use of family tree charts such as, the, such as that fan chart that you showed? I mean, if you wanted to do something like that at home, are there resources to find that? Um, sure. So with that, um, to be quite honest, um, there are numerous sites that have that available. Um, I actually uh, believe I just found that one from researching. It may have been through Family Search. Um, I do also know that the um, NEHDS bookstore has a lot of these um, charts available as well that you can buy. Um, and you, they're good to actually, because they're pretty permanent too, I think, um, you can use them to really um, keep your research safe too when using these printed ones. Um, but they really are pretty freely available um, if you actually just go online and search for um, blank fan chart templates. Um, I, I found that there's quite a few that are available um, and there's a bunch of different styles. So you can also find the one that might be best for you. Great, thanks. Um, March is asking about kind of how do you determine the re reliability of a published genealogy? So, I mean, for example, if you if you're using a genealogy, especially one that's maybe written in the 19th century that is unsourced, and it says that there's this royal connection, um, would you then suggest going to one of the published sources to see if that line is um, included there or um, what would you do if you if you find that information in a uh, kind of a family history? 
Okay, so that's a great question. So, um, and actually, Geneva alluded to this in the question itself was that if you do find something in a source and it doesn't give a citation as to where that was found, um, you know, I always would say be skeptical of that in a way. But um, looking at the published sources that um, we had talked about is always a good way to go. And um, honestly, you can never do too much research in a way in that if you find it in one source and something doesn't seem quite right, you know, check another source because a lot of these sources will have the same information that's repeated and usually they'll give more um, in-depth citations in those as well. Now, um, I think that looking at the citations are the most important way to tell if something is legitimate or not because unfortunately these claims were pretty frequent in earlier times and actually even today to the point where someone might have mentioned at one point that you know there is this dissent but then they don't describe how and it may not even be true so i would certainly recommend looking at those published sources and as to getting a better sense of which ones are reliable I would certainly check the websites of the various lineage societies that we talked about, because I know for a fact that the um, Descendants of the Crown of Charlemagne has on their website under the section about um, filling out your membership application, they actually have a list of sources that say, do not use these. And there's also quite a few that they say, these are the best ones to use. So I would, definitely consult with the um, Lineage Society websites and see what they recommend as well, because if they're accepting certain sources as proof, you can be pretty assured in the fact that they're probably pretty reliable in that sense. Um, and Linda's asking just uh, for a clarification. So is a gateway ancestor the one who immigrated to the US in a particular line? Um, most often, yes. Um, with the, there's no set in stone, I guess, definition of a gateway ancestor in some senses. Anyone could, in theory, be a gateway ancestor. But most of the um, published lists on the websites I've found almost always are the first generation. I would say, in most cases, they were probably born prior to about 1675. Um, on these lists, but, you know, like I said, there may be some that list later ancestors. Um, some may even list if there's famous people, if there's US presidents, things like that, they could be on the list as well. Um, so there's no set in stone definition of that. But in most cases, it is going to generally be either first or second generation in America. And uh, several people are asking about, um, you know, learning about uh, descents from Irish kings, from Scandinavian uh, royalty, from um, other countries outside of the UK. And uh, can you just kind of confirm, well, Irish is whatever, but um, can you confirm um, some of the published sources that you mentioned? Um, are any of those good for um, looking at royalty outside of the United Kingdom? Yes, so the um, source by um, Frederick Lewis Weiss, its name, it is escaping me, I'm sorry, there's so many uh, that are fairly similar, but um, his book um, is definitely the go-to source for that. Um, when I say it has kings and queens from any, most countries you can think of, that's pretty accurate in that sense. Um, there are, that is definitely the way to go because that is probably the most reliable source I can think of that will trace a line all the way back to Charlemagne. Most other sources will generally stop at um, the Plantagenet kings or sometimes slightly earlier. Um, most don't go back all the way to Charlemagne um, and some will actually go back well before the year 1000, at least um, the Weiss lines do. Um, so I would certainly recommend that source. And also just as a note, um, the syllabus for this that is available, um, there's a comprehensive list of sources and each source actually lists um, after it, there's a key for the different countries and which sources discuss 
um, kings and queens from which country. So that also, I would say, certainly consult that as well, because um, I'm sure there are some that are slipping my mind at the moment. So um, I, I would certainly recommend looking at that. And um, I have the syllabus in front of me. The uh, the Frederick Lewis Weiss book is um, Ancestral Roots of Certain American Colonists Who Came to America Before 1700. So a long title, um, but yes, and uh, as Zach mentioned, it includes uh, lines from Flanders, France, uh, Germany, Holland, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Jerusalem, Poland, Scotland, um, so well beyond um, kind of British royalty. Um, a few questions about kind of, again, the reliability of information and especially that which is shown online. So, for example, family search, um, you know, looking at trees on ancestry or family search, if they show that you are related to royalty, you know, how reliable should we consider that to be? And again, is it maybe a clue that you then verify elsewhere? So I think actually, again, you know, as as you mentioned there, Ginevra, um, I, I think that perhaps looking at trees on Ancestry and other websites um, can certainly be a good jumping off point. If you see something online, and especially um, since unfortunately a lot of these trees tend to um, either be unsighted or have pretty sparse citations, um, you certainly are going to want to go through and um, do some of your own verification. Um, and it should be pretty easy in that I would look for the first ancestor that can be verified with either a record that's attached to the tree, or um, if a work is cited there, um, if it mentions the Richardson books, I would certainly, even if it is mentioned, I just to be certain, I would consult those as well, just to make absolutely sure um, that that is something that can be verified. And um, just because something isn't, un, isn't cited doesn't necessarily mean that it should be dismissed, but it should be viewed as uh, needing more research. And um, usually it's a pretty good way to um, do that by looking at the published sources. But if you, for example, see a tree and you go four or five generations from royalty and suddenly there's a name that's not coming up in any of the sources, then you would certainly want to revisit some of that. Um, I've seen on occasion, and this isn't super prevalent, but often enough that um, there will be a name that's either someone will mix up a name somewhere because in that time period, there were a lot of the same names used over and over. So somewhere along the line, somebody mixed up a John and a Robert, something like that. And then you find out that these two parents never had a son named Robert. And then things kind of start to unravel from there. So using the published sources is always good, um, especially a book like the Richardson books, where they actually also list out all of the children of every um, set of parents. So that's a good way to really confirm that these children belong to the parents that these trees are saying they belong to. And several people have also asked about, you know, accessing some of these uh, published resources that you've mentioned by Douglas Richardson, by Gary Boyd Roberts, by F uh, Frederick Weiss. Um, they are available at the American Ancestors Research Center, um, and they should be available at several other uh, public or private libraries near you. And, and I would just suggest using WorldCat dot org. Um, you can type in the name of the title that you're looking for and your zip code, and it will tell you where the closest um, publicly available or accessible version of the book is um, the closest one to you. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. Um, we also had a question. You talked a little bit about illegitimate um, children of royalty. Do these resources include um, illegitimate lines as well? Um, in, in some cases, they certainly do. Um, in a lot of, I know in the Richardson books, there are quite a few lines that um, even if the person was not later legitimized, um, 
they're still usually included because if they're the issue in some cases is proving that parentage but at this point in time a lot of the older kings and queens of england um we know most of the illegitimate children they're pretty well proven through documents that um have been discovered over the last several centuries um but these books always in my research i found do include a lot of these lines through these illegitimate children um and if for some reason you come across a source and it doesn't list that again i i would definitely recommend looking at the sources that are recommended by some of the lineage societies that do specifically serve um the descendants of these illegitimate children um especially because um several centuries ago illegitimate children were far more prevalent than they are in this day and age it seems with uh royalty so there were um a lot more that were um chronicled through various records so they are listed in um most of these sources from what i'm finding yes and christina also asks an interesting question about um kind of gender patterns to gateway ancestors i mean so obviously a gateway ancestor doesn't have to be male <laughs> um yes. are there i mean do you see that there are more men that are gateway ancestors more women or is it just kind of in the nature of you know who's been recorded and who's been um who shows up in these records so um you know that's actually a really interesting question and um i i suppose i should actually have mentioned uh they're not exclusively men a lot of these lists will um list they they have quite a few women but i would say it does skew heavily towards men and i think a large part of that is just because especially in early colonial america it's just men tended to appear in the records more um and they're ancestry tends to be a bit more well known in some cases not always um so it does seem to lean more heavily towards male gateway ancestors however there are um several and i believe ann hutchinson is one that i saw and i um made note of as well i know um there are quite a few women listed um it just tends to be more males all right. And um, kind of another question about patterns in gateway ancestors. I mean, do you see them kind of in pockets, you know, so, you know, are there, do you, are there more royal, are there more gateway ancestors who immigrant, who immigrate to the US and kind of set up shop in, say, Dorchester or, you know, in Connecticut or in certain areas, I mean, um, or in the South? I mean, do you see kind of pockets of these gateway ancestors kind of sticking together? um you know that that's a great question and i haven't noticed any real notable patterns in that sense um and i mean i think that that um how i had discussed earlier about the different colonial governors and it seems like i listed almost every state at the time um which kind of serves to show that they really did spread out in a way um it was really up and down the coast. Now I do feel that um, a lot of them did. It seems I find more that are um, along the coast in Massachusetts. However, some did go inland, of course. Um, and some, of course, went to uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut and that area as well. But it does seem that they tended to cluster more towards the coast. Um, and for one reason or another, and I'm not actually entirely sure why that is, but um, so it really, you know, it, I guess, in a way, it's not like if you have descendants from this town, it's very likely that there's a gateway ancestor or vice versa, because um, they did spread out quite a bit. All right. Um... I would be remiss if I didn't ask this because so many questions are coming in about DNA. And, you know, um, I know that's not necessarily an area that you specialize in, Zach, but, you know, folks are asking, are there any DNA sites that can confirm royal lineage? Are there, you know, do you know if there are Y DNA groups or, um, you know, other outlets that might look at um, kind of royal DNA and how that could be used to make a connection? 
Um, you know, that is a great question. And um, as, as you alluded to, it's it's a bit out of my wheelhouse. So I, I'd hate to um, give information when I'm not entirely familiar with that. Um, so in that case, I probably would defer to, and often I do this when it comes to DNA, um, someone else who was on staff like Chris Child, who um, is one of our DNA experts on staff, who would definitely be able to answer this much better than I. Um, so, you know, I, unfortunately, I don't really have much experience in that, um, in that area, so I'm not entirely sure. Um. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you for, you know, like I said, I just wanted to ask it. Um, of course, I did see a lot of them coming in. So I was thinking, you know, I, I'm i glad you addressed that. <laughs> yeah. um, and certainly looking at DNA blogs, um, you know, just DNA websites, looking up, you know, Royal DNA, see what comes up, um, you know, Google or Bing or your search engine of choice can be your friend. Um, now, one other, a few other questions before um, we close for the day. Um, you know, if someone is having trouble, you know, in your case study, for example, and, and in your step-by-step -step look, you want it, you suggested going back as far as possible. If you are kind of stuck in, say, the 18th century, or, you know, you just can't get back to the immigrant ancestor, um, you know, do you have any strategies or suggestions on how to get around that? Um, so while I, do, it's not always necessarily the best practice, I would say to just abandon a line that you can't find anything on, but sometimes I think it does help to either, you know, if you're, there's one that you're really stuck on, I would advocate for broadening your search with into other ancestors that you um, may not have considered only because the more names you gather, the better in a way. Um, and also a lot of times, um, you know, while there may not be huge clusters of these gateway ancestors, um, usually if there's one, you may have multiple. Um, so it is entirely possible if there's one that you really can't push forward through a particular brick wall instead of zeroing in on that unless you have a very you know unless it's a matching surname that really makes you think okay these people have to be related but I can't prove it then maybe you might want to really dig your heels in and go forward with that one but otherwise I would certainly recommend um, expanding your search and um, you know I touched on this briefly but I would always say um, look at the wives of these individuals, especially if the husband has a surname that you're not seeing on a list of gateway ancestors, um, looking at the wives and then their mothers and their mothers, because then that gives you a much broader base of names to look for. Um, so that that's how I would approach that situation. I think also if you have, you know, if you're maybe just a few generations, um, maybe from where your line ends and maybe where um, a, say a gateway ancestor of the same surname, the same area. I mean, is that kind of another approach where you're, you're kind of doing descendancy research at one point and, or is, or do you just suggest that we, that we don't do that, that we always work from the known back to the unknown? Um, can you kind of go in both directions and see if there's a connection that way? Um, you can certainly go in both directions. Um, usually, I would recommend starting from what you know, just as you mentioned, it's usually the easiest way to go. And also, I find sometimes when um, you start with the unknown going to the known, your mind tends to want to make a connection. You'll see a name and you're like, oh, maybe it is, but it might not be the best way to proceed with that um, however that being said if you're either if it's from something you saw in a book or online and something that really makes you think that there is a connection between your ancestor but you're missing a couple generations um, and a known gateway ancestor then in that case you certainly could start with the gateway ancestor and work downward but um, that just may require a lot more work in the sense that you'd have to look at 
every child of every individual there. So um, it might not be the best way to go forward, but in certain circumstances, it definitely is a viable solution. All right. Well, thank you again, Zach, for your presentation, for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, if you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team or uh, using our expanded chat service. So the chat service puts you in direct communication with a genealogist. It's free and open to the public Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5 Eastern time with extended hours on Wednesdays 9 to 8 p.m. and you can access that service by going to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat and I will be including that link as well as a link to the recording and the syllabus that you can purchase on our website in my follow-up email to you later today. So again uh, thank you for joining us and thank you again Zach you've given us maybe a fun activity to do over the holidays um, and Everyone, as you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create other uh, free programs for you and uh, folks around the world. If you'd like to access more how to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit us at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research and from all of us at American Ancestors, we wish you a happy and healthy holiday season. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.